So, okay, welcome to the workshop on, uh, yeah, on uh, Sweden and Swedish imperialism. Well, I will say uh, a little, a few things more about that later. Um, first of all, we are very happy to welcome Aris Patris, who is, um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Aris is responsible for ideology and studies in the, in the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Sweden. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Communist Party of Sweden is the historical Communist Party of Sweden. Um, and it is also a member of the Secretariat of the European Initiative of Communist and Workers' Parties. Yeah, so most of you have uh, probably already listened to Comrade Andreas Sörensen. Um, the chairman of the party who participated in our plenary discussion yesterday uh, on imperialism. So I think I don't have to explain too much about uh, the general position of the SKP on imperialism. To put it briefly, the SKP rejects the notion that um, imperialism is a quality of only a few selected countries at the top of the world hierarchy. Um, instead, it views imperialism as a, yeah, as a social relation, as the highest stage of capitalism which is why the SKP also does not use imperialist as a description for um, one or the other country, but rather as a term to describe the world system as a whole. You can correct me, of course, if I say something wrong. <laughs> yes, um, so now today's seminar will be about the history of Swedish imperialism, um, of the role of Sweden within the imperialist system, the plans for Sweden joining imperialist alliances, and finally also the special role of social democracy and the so-called Swedish welfare model for Swedish capitalism and the rule of the bourgeoisie in Sweden. I think uh, this is probably already enough <laughs> from my side because I don't want to steal the time of Comrade Aris. Um, so thank you for being here and we are all um, very excited to hear what you have to say. Okay, yes, thank you for, uh, it's nice to be here uh, and to be able to, to speak about the, this uh, topic. Right, so when I told uh, uh, the KO what I was going to talk about, I was uh, uh, kind of, uh, I, I didn't had uh, done, I ha hadn't uh, been finished with the presentation. So it's not exactly what, uh, what you told, but uh, kind of, uh, we were uh, in, in the middle of the, our election uh, uh, campaign for the parliament, for the Swedish parliament, so we, we didn't have so much time back then. Uh, but later we change it a bit, so I can uh, describe the ch uh, schedule for uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, so first, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the Swedish model and the uh, so-called non-alignment uh, policy or uh, neutrality of uh, the Swedish state. And then uh, we're going to have a Leninist analysis and uh, try to debunk these myths about uh, the Swedish neutrality and about the Swedish model, uh, or also known as Nordic uh, model. And then I think it's a kind of a long time to talk all the time, so we have a small break, five minutes, if it's all right for you. And then finally, we're going to talk about the non-alignment movement today and the role of the communist vis-a-vis -vis what we see as an opportunist way of seeing it. Firstly, uh, I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to hear what do you think about uh, the German public uh, opinion about Sweden? Not maybe yours uh, personal, but, uh, but the, the, the general public, what do they think about when they uh, hear about Sweden? I'm, I'm genuinely uh, interested in that because I know in other countries how they view Sweden. But uh, if you want, you can talk to those around you. Uh, two minutes uh, and then you can, you can tell me uh, afterwards. Unfortunately, at this point the recording was interrupted for about 10 minutes. We apologize and hope that the presentation remains understandable anyway. Uh, so, we had also a state repression of the SKP, so we say this uh, liberal Sweden and all these things. Uh, it was a ban on newspaper, so it was a ban on uh, distributing communist uh, newspaper. And this is a law passed against SKP, expli explicitly passed against SKP inside of the uh, parliament. Uh, this is all, all during uh, social democratic rule. Uh, and uh, they had raids and imprisonment of SKP leadership. Uh, a lot of uh, whole leadership got imprisoned. And of course, uh, this registers that led to uh, work camps for communists. So during the war, uh, 
the communists got uh, uh, to special places inside of Sweden for military duty, uh, with no weapons, uh, in remote places, isolated uh, from the public. Uh, and also, it's, it has been discussed, uh, during, uh, 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 scholars have discussed what the meaning of it was. So they say uh, maybe they wanted to isolate them from the public, so to, not to spread anti-German propaganda. Maybe they wanted to have them easily bound together so they can give them to the Germans uh, when they come. Uh, and yeah, not make I, I, what I believe or what we believe as a part of the main reason is like when you can get communists out of <laughs> out of the way you do that because they are getting all the all the problems in, in the production, in the strikes, and of course in the general public. Uh, we can say also that it, it was only the communist uh, newspapers that got banned. Uh, some like when they're talking about this in, in schools, now they never mention anything about that, but they say, now they have started to say that some liberal newspapers got their uh, uplaga, is it the same in German? So this day's newspaper, this day's and yesterday's uh, newspaper uh, was uh, taken back, taken back by the government because it said something against Nazi Germany. So that was some liberal newspapers, you know, now and then. Censorship, yes, censorship, censorship, but they were they were never banned uh, completely. But the communist uh, newspaper, good. So all these places are uh, documented places with work camps for communists, uh, and there were a lot more. So they burned all the paper, the, all the documentation. So we don't know everything, and that's the that's the bourgeoisie scholars that say that we don't know everything. Uh, it's uh, it's commonly known that there were more more of uh, more than this. Also. Uh, there were concentration camps in Sweden, and this is a very uh, a, a topic that is um, uh, it's not everyone agrees with this. But uh, uh, there were 4,000 foreign communists in Sweden that were put in camps, and they were not uh, not uh, because of what they did, but because of who they were. Uh, and they were not uh, there were no trial, and they were on a time that is not uh, decided how long time you will be there. So this is the, uh, actually the three um, definitions of what the concentration camp is according to United Nation, Nations. So you could say, you could call this a concentration, concentration camps and it was under the National Board of Health and Welfare uh, of the Social Democratic Minister Gustav Müller. And this is not, so, not something that they want to talk so much about. So let's take a five minute break so we can go to the toilet. <laughs> All right, uh, so I, I hope you all understand what the Swedish model is about now. And uh, uh, what we need to understand is what the Swedish model provided for the monopolies. So one thing for me when I travel uh, around Europe is that I see all the time, when I, wherever I come, I see that Sweden is kind of 10 years ahead all the time in, uh, when it comes to digitalization, when it comes to you know easy payments, easy transactions, uh, everything is so much modern in Sweden than it is in much stronger uh, countries if you see to absolute uh, power. Uh, you see that Sweden is a highly, highly developed country, capitalist country. Uh, and this is also if you compare to like Denmark or other countries in North, Finland, maybe Norway is on the same uh, level. Uh, so the Swedish model has led to Sweden being, in comparison with most other countries, highly developed regarding the degree of concentration of capital. This can be noticed uh, all uh, in the effective management of the Swedish state, both the politically independent authorities, like I think maybe you have in Germany as well, right? So you have authorities that are kind of independent, they don't change with the, the political government, right? Uh, like in Sweden, everybody listens to them and they are like the authorities. Uh, like uh, for instance, during COVID uh, crisis, everyone listens to them and the political parties have nothing to say, right? Uh, that's what, what we mean by independent. And then also we have uh, the political parties in the parliament also in accordance with the needs of the big corporations all the time. 
the latter is made in such an elaborated way that makes it impossible to distinguish the state from the monopolies. So we can try to summarize what the Swedish model provided to the monopolies and why it was so good for them. So you had this stability in production. Of course, uh, you, you, you were combat combating communist strikes, very effective. Uh, so after 1945, we kind of have no strikes in Sweden. So we went from being uh, the most uh, strike uh, with high strike density to the country with the lowest strike density. It's almost impossible due to all these things I explained of the Swedish model to, to strike in Sweden. Uh, we have stability in finance. So you have the possibility to control real wage wages very effectively because you have these years agreements with peace, uh, you, you're bound to peace during these agreements. You cannot, uh, uh, you have three years, the capitalists know exactly what the real wages are and uh, they can also account on the profits and it makes its stability in the, their finances. Uh, it's very important. And also stability in power, of course, uh, the parties don't take any hits uh, for, the political, uh, for, for the policies being put forward because the hits, like, like it's not the social democratic party that decides something, it's the unions. So uh, the party doesn't have to take uh, um, unpopular reforms. And it's, it is the possibility of making big changes in a smooth way. When I say big reforms, uh, like we saw in Sweden during the 30s, and, the, and especially after World War II, I know it was the same in all of Europe, uh, but it, it went on in a very smooth way in Sweden. Uh, and sometimes even with the working class appearing as the initiators of these reforms, due to the state in Sweden being the same as the working class movement. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I've, I've written here, capital is still as a progressive power. This, we can have a lecture on this uh, by, its, uh, by itself. This is a very important issue that maybe is, uh, is worthy of the, this kind of Congress by itself. So uh, how much did actually the proto-Euro-communist parties or the communist parties, uh, reformed communist parties during this era actually had to do with the changes in, you know, building uh, houses, for homes for the people, uh, building... Um, uh, uh, kindergartens and all these things, you know, the social democratic reforms uh, of the Second World War. How much was it actually uh, something to do with the uh, like uh, class struggle or was it maybe more uh, the needs of capitalism to take? Like in Sweden, you had these, all these farmers that needed to be transported into the big cities and you had to, to, to uh, grow the, uh, st uh, the state apparatus uh, and have uh, all these uh, things get, like you needed hospitals for the workers so they can go, go back to production and all these things. Of course, on the marginal, on the marginal, uh, the, communist, uh, the communist managed to do some things. Like the capitalists never needed the, uh, the, the Swedish working class to go to school and study German, for example, or arts and these things. So you, of, of course you can win things. But I mean, the big reforms, it was not... Like, oh, I, I don't need to say so much about this because we don't have so much time. Uh, but the, the Swedish model was very good for making these big reforms. So the concentration of Swedish capital, uh, this is like, it's hard to see, but to, hard to believe maybe. But it's actually, it's, it's 15 con conglomerates of families that uh, own 70% of uh, the Stockholm Stock Exchange. And uh, we, we know them. Like we can say the names of them and we know what they own. Maybe you, you know some of these, uh, it's international, international known. Um, uh, so for example, all media in Sweden, like I mean all media, like 95% of media. And when I say media, I mean uh, cinema, I mean distribution of, uh, you know, uh, publishers. So like one person owns 100 publisher, in their turn they, they own all other publishers, all newspapers, all radio channels, all TV channels, uh, phone um, cards, uh, dis distribution chains, everything, everything is controlled by three families. So the, the same family that has the social democratic newspaper also owes, owns the, uh, the Christian Democrat newspaper. And so it's, it's actually, it's the same company. Uh, that uh, owns everything, everything, uh, from every radio cha channel to all, all things are three. Uh, 
Uh, and these uh, are some of the, the families, or this is all the families, and they together control as much as this family, uh, Wallenberg, uh, Wallenberg family, uh, of course, uh, the biggest hero of the social democracy in Sweden. They have a uh, Jas Gripen uh, with Saab and all these things. We can, we can see the concentration to take them as an example. So the sixth generation of Wallenberg uh, today, yes, we have these happy kids. Uh, so I just, you, you, maybe you know some of these uh, companies. This is just some of the, the companies that they own. But he was the leader of the social democracy. He was not the leader of the social democracy, ah, okay. but he was a very good friend, like we see here with the prime minister. Uh, they're handling the deals with Saudi Arabia to sell Wallenberg's planes, Jas Gripen, uh, to Saudi Arabia. So we have a lot of companies that are international, big. You know they own the uh, biggest por portion of Nasdaq in the uh, in, uh, United States. Saab, of course. Banks, uh, Q-Lager. It's Q Lager, uh, you know, the small balls inside of wheels that are turning. Yes, it's uh, the big uh, factories in in Netherlands and uh, this uh, Svenska Q Lager fabriken. <clears throat> Schools, uh, universities, banks, uh, everything, you know. And uh, with these companies, they own like hundreds of more companies. Uh, so it's uh, the capital concentration. This is just to, to illustrate how the capital concentration is in Sweden. And of course, we know that due, during time, capital concentrations increases. And in Sweden, this has come to a very high level of concentration. So uh, now we see, so lo like until now, I, I've described how good this model has been for, so, uh, for, uh, for capitalism in Sweden. So uh, the Swedish model, The Swedish model, which have worked very well for the monopolies historically until now, have lost its appeal. The communist movement has long been crumbling. The big reforms that was needed to reshape the agrarian Swedes into laborers is fulfilled. So the big portion of the capitalist mercenaries are weathering blood and is ready to exchange a part of the stability derived from the former policies for larger returns in the short term. Something that, of course, is driven by the harsh comp competition inside the ca imperialist system. And this is the very important thing to understand. And that's uh, maybe some of you have read uh, our analysis of imperialism. So this is the way we need to apply and to understand imperialism. Uh, we need to use it as what, why, like, like we can understand that social democracy cannot come back, right? It was an historically uh, event like the, it was needs of capitalism due, during this time. Today we have competition like what they produce in Sweden, highly technology developed uh, country, they can produce easily in India, right? We cannot have this system anymore. It's pushed away of imperialism. Imperialism pushes it away. We cannot have uh, this kind of uh, capitalism cannot afford to have this strategy anymore. Uh, so uh, we have uh, the dismantling of this Swedish model. So we see now uh, they actually passed the law that they tried to pass through, uh, through the labor, the, the Swedish model, but they couldn't. So the left party together with the social democrats, the left party of, of course critical, but they vote for the government. Uh, so they passed these laws against uh, uh, Security, you can, uh, you can fire workers however you want and all these things. It was two years ago they passed this law and uh, making the uh, working atmosphere, working insurances. So like they, they take them away, right? Because you cannot have them. Uh, you cannot produce in Sweden uh, three times the cost like they produce in China, Russia, or Brazil or uh, everywhere else. So you need to push the wages down. You need to make uh, everything more the surplus value being uh, you, you cannot use that to uh, you have to increase the surplus uh, value of course so also in this strategy is uh, joining NATO 
so let's see about this uh, non-alignment uh, policy uh, and the Swedish neutrality in history. So I will not bring you back to 18, 1821 when they uh, say that uh, this uh, neutrality is from. Uh, we don't need that. Uh, we can just uh, see a couple of things. Uh, so this is, of course, a big lie, right? Uh, it has uh, been an important and integral part of the administration model alongside the so-called Swedish model of labor peace. Uh, and it has uh, contributed to the view of Sweden as a mixed state in between socialism and capitalism, in the economy and in the foreign policy. In reality, uh, the non-alignment, of course, has been a, a huge lie. Uh, so you can go travel wherever and you, see, you find all of Palme Square or all of Palme Street or something like that. So it's, uh, everyone thinks of it it's as something very noble and fine and all these things. So we know already from the World War uh, one that uh, that Swedish took a stand on the side of Germany. Of course, uh, that's uh, one uh, why why it was so much social unrest. It, it was because they they gave all they sold all wheat. Uh, they hadn't bread in Sweden because they sold it to German soldiers. Uh, they uh, exported it to to, to Germany. Uh, in Spain, uh, so the social democratic government uh, passed a law forbidding. Uh, anyone to join the resistance to, uh, to fighting uh, in the international brigades uh, with, uh, of course, the communists went, 500 communists from the Swedish Communist Party went, uh, but they took the sides, of course, of the fascists. And uh, during Second World War, uh, they was obviously on the, uh, on the Nazis' side uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, not only did they only export uh, their uh, precious iron and woods to Germany, uh, they also, of course, let uh, German soldiers pass uh, through Sweden. And we know, it's very known, uh, all the uh, capitalists um, uh, in Sweden, how they uh, um, was in favor of, uh, of, uh, of the Nazis and also the king and uh, all this. And, and in modern times, we have uh, NATO. So joint uh, corpor uh, uh, cooperation with uh, NATO. Uh, so in agreements and also in, uh, in joint military exercises, exercises uh, sending military to Afghanistan, to Kosovo, to Mali, supporting the intervention in Libya with airplanes. But they were not sh shooting, right? They were spot spotting where the Americans should shoot. So that's the neutrality of Sweden. So we know, of course, it never existed. But what we also know existed was this precious uh, conception that worked so well for, uh, for capitalism in Sweden, that Sweden is this mixed economy. Sweden is this neutral country. Uh, it was important, together with the Swedish model, to push this uh, labor peace. Uh, so why do they want to abandon this uh, policy now? It's, uh, of course, also uh, imperialism drives it uh, this way. It's uh, more uh, lucrative. It's, more, uh, it's better for them to be in NATO. So in the harsh imperialist competition, for uh, the monopolies need to reallocate state spendings for, uh, from unproductive sectors, such as provided healthcare or education, to the military. The strategy is supported directly, directly or uh, indir indirectly by all parties in the parliament is to make Sweden a NATO member, something that have been sought after for a long period but not been possible to achieve due to public opinion. The Russian invasion of Ukraine presented itself as a perfect reason to finally push the agenda of NATO membership. The full membership is beneficial, like when I say full membership, Sweden practically is a member of NATO, uh, but they, are not full mem they, don't, they don't have full membership. So the full membership is beneficial for the monopolies for several reasons. Primarily, it allows the Swedish imperialism to increase its participation in the division of the world markets, where war is just a violent continuation of standard politics. They have already announced that in joining NATO, they will have permanent troops in the, in the Balt countries. Uh, which is a market controlled already by Swedish monopolies. So they, of course, want, they need uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to protect these uh, uh, very big uh, capital investments they have. So they control, uh, actually, uh, all these countries, uh, both countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and, uh, uh, and Estonia. And we can see, like, uh, German capital export in these countries are very low in comparison to Swedish. So they have been let to, 
you know, trade off, like you send troops here, you do this, and uh, we take this part, you take this part. So they, uh, they have already announced that uh, when, we, when we join NATO, we are going to send troops there. Of course, not to, uh, to uh, stabilize our investments, but to counter Russian troops. Uh, also, uh, big uh, construction companies have been promised a significant role in the eventual built-up of Ukrainian infrastructure. And they publicly announced this, and it's a very good thing. And it's for, to help the Ukrainian people, of course, that the Swedish companies get these huge contracts. Uh, equally important is the feeding of the Swedish arms industry, with huge direct links to, uh, to the monopoly families, as we saw in Wallenberg and Saab. Uh, as the state spendings on military upgrades go straight to their pockets, as well as a free promotion of their weapons in new markets. markets. Of course, it is easier to sell weapons inside NATO than from a position outside of NATO. So, I mean, it's obvious what the capitalist earns about, uh, with joining NATO. So, the last section and the shortest section, uh, I know I have just talked and you have not uh, been so uh, involved uh, so it's good to, for us to have a, a longer discussion. Uh, so there is no significant movement against NATO in Sweden. The public op opinion was always against joining NATO and keep up the false understanding of Sweden as a neutral state. But now they are afraid of Russia and everything have changed. So everyone, almost everyone is for joining NATO. Uh, joining NATO is in the interest of the Swedish monopolies. They are for sure, the Swedish monopolies are for sure no one's puppets. They are not controlled by America, they are not controlled by Brussels, they are not controlled by Germany or any other capitalist country. They are acting in the interest of their own profits, obviously. So <laughs> Marx and Lenin was of course right. Uh, this is how capital concentration and distribution of power works. So. What we can see in Sweden, and I think we can see it in the most countries of the world, because we see it from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, it's the same, uh, same ar arguments. The opportunists express the old strategy of the capitalists, which have worked very well for them historically until now to take the power back. They say, we need to take the power back from Brussels. That's why we need to, to uh, uh, leave the European Union. Uh, we are going to be the puppets of the United States if we join NATO. Uh, So what, we, uh, what do we as communists say? Uh, so we want also, of course, out of NATO. Uh, we want out of European Union and every other temporary imperialist alliance, but not because we want a false non-alignment policy to be kept, not because we want the power back from Brussels. We as a people never had that power. The power is in uh, the hand of the capitalist that owns all that, uh, these companies and also it's their state, right? So the capitalists have the power, but we want to fight uh, NATO and EU because these are imperialist alliances. That is tools for the capitalists in our country and in other countries to be used to their own benefits, not the benefits of Americans only or Germans only or someone else only. We as Swedes are not occupied by foreign power. Our lives are occupied by the capitalists uh, in our country. Uh, so that's our stance uh, in this, and it's a very big difference uh, between what we say and they're saying to us, come join a uh, uh, front against NATO and all these things, but why are we going to do that? So we're not going to join uh, a false perception of going back to the same as it is uh, today. So we need to push, we as communists, if, if we as communists doesn't do it, who's going to talk about uh, another, that, that we don't need this uh, system? that we need another system that uh, is for the people, that is uh, to, to, to uh, produce uh, things that we need, not in, uh, by uh, profit, uh, and all these things. That's why we need a communist party. Uh, and that's only, it's only with this, uh, uh, if, if we talk to people in this way, that they will be on our sides in all fights, not only in this fight. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your input. Um, 
Yeah, we wanted to uh, structure the discussion to um, three parts, Sweden, imperialism and war in the Ukraine. But with the 45 minutes, I think we are not getting <laughs> to all of these points. Uh, because of this one uh, suggestion, um, we now have time for 15 minutes um, questions to Sweden and uh, to the report. And then we discuss uh, maybe more to the role of Sweden and the NATO, to the relation of um, Germany, Sweden, NATO, Russia, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, um, first questions. So, äh, dann frage ich mal auf Deutsch, dann kannst du ja übersetzen. Äh, ich würde noch mal gerne was zu den Konsequenzen hören, wenn man äh, diese Vereinbarung zwischen den Gewerkschaften und den äh, Kapitalisten äh, brechen sollte. Weil es wurde gesagt, es ist kein Gesetz, sondern eine Vereinbarung. Und also drei Jahre zum Beispiel äh, wird irgendwas festgelegt und in der Zeit ist Frieden abgemacht. Aber es ist ja kein Gesetz, das wurde ja gesagt. Und ich würde gerne wissen, welche Konsequenzen äh, man haben sollte, sollte zum Beispiel die Kommunistische Partei trotzdem einen Streik organisieren. Verliert man dann seinen Arbeitsplatz oder wie sieht das dann weiter aus? Ähm, vielleicht sammeln wir noch. Macht immer das Mikro aus, wenn ihr genau es weitergebt, damit es nicht so stört. Uh, you mentioned uh, Sweden's new strategy. Um, can you elaborate why Sweden um, needs to have NATO membership now, but uh, why they were not part of NATO in the 20th century? I didn't get that part. Uh, I want to ask maybe a bit a question of the Communist Party. Do you have a history of opportunism in the side of the party and uh, yeah, how did you handle it? How did you handle the opportunists? Okay, maybe you want to answer now? Or more questions? Yeah. Okay, I think I've translated one uh, of the questions. Um, so he asked about, uh, about this agreement between the unions and the capitalists that you mentioned. Um, and so his question is, uh, what would the consequences have been um, in case, for example, the Communist Party organized a strike, um, so what would happen then? Because you said it was not a law, but um, were there any consequences to be um, to be feared if uh, you did that? Uh, yes, you can. You can lose your job and you can get fines, but you cannot be put in prison. So basically, it's, the, it's that. So uh, if you, you organize a strike, uh, you, it's a wild strike. It call, it's called a wild strike. And sometimes you can do that without having anything, any con consequences. It depends on uh, how strong the strike is and what they fear will happen if they punish you. Yeah, uh, and then we had the second question. It was about... It was about uh, the new strategy, it was right, uh, so. This one, right? So uh, the question is about uh, why uh, they want to abandon the, the last. So it's, uh, it's uh, very expensive to uphold uh, such a system. It's not, it's not so effective uh, to uphold uh, such, a, such, such a system with uh, having a welfare state and uh, all these things and uh, be uh, having to uh, um, uh, to all the time have this um, um, so if you want to cut the uh, if you have problems with uh, the, they have too many uh, breaks for example during their work so uh, you, it's it's not so effective to uh, to do that inside the labor uh, movement because you have to uh, have wait three years and then have the agreement again and, uh, uh, and it's much more e easier of course to pass a law and say it's forbidden uh, so uh, but but that makes people angry right 
So uh, you have to trade off the belief in the state that every Swede have. They have a deep, deep belief in the state as something good, as something good for the workers. You trade that off because you cannot do otherwise, because it's too expensive. You have to compete in imperialism, in the imperialist system with all the other countries, which have much uh, more effective production. So what you do is you, you, you raising the surplus value by losing some of the uh, belief in the state. So of course it's a high game they play, but because if you cut this model, then you cut also the, uh, uh, you, 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 you boil water and you push the, um, yes, you push it down, it will boil over, right? But if you have this uh, ventile, is the same in German? Yes, it goes out and it's, it can boil all the time, right? The ventile is the Swedish model, but, but the imperialist system makes you have to leave that. You have to, to take every margin and, and put back in the capitalist uh, accumulation because uh, you, have, you compete with others. If you don't do that, you, sh you, you lose the shares of the markets to Russians, to uh, Norwegians, to Germans, to any, anyone. Right? So we, we can also see that, it's, it's a long discussion, but we can also see that, that uh, like during uh, the social, uh, socialism, so real, real socialism, when, when it existed socialist countries and you had these all uh, colonial uh, countries that got independent uh, and all these things, you had uh, actually maybe one third or even more of the, of the world outside of the capitalist system or outside of the direct control of imperialists. And they, since then they had a lot, long time to to take over these parts again, one by one, you know, all the wars in uh, Syria, Libya, everywhere, but it's ended, right? So they, you cannot get these extra profits uh, uh, so easily, and you need to get them from everywhere in the competition. So you cannot have, you cannot, you cannot afford to spend money on security. It's a very easy way uh, to put it, but I hope you understand what, what we mean with that. Uh, and. The question, the third question was about the history of op opportunism in SKP, so. I think this question was about why Sweden was not, uh, was not a NATO member before. Uh -huh, yes, ah, yes, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, as we see it, it's a, a part of that conception that Sweden is neutral, but it was never neutral, but uh, for, for the outside people and for the Swedes, they think that they are neutral and they think that we're a mixed economy, it's socialism and uh, capitalism uh, together and we're, we're not uh, uh, interv intervening in other countries. It's, it was a very important part of that uh, conception. And also the public opinion were against, of course, because of that conception of what Sweden is, what Sweden thinks that Sweden is, and what the rest of the world think of Sweden. Uh, so it was, uh, it was, they were not able to do it, so they did it, actually, so everything was joined with Na NATO, but like it's not NATO full membership, right? So uh, now it was a perfect, perfect way to do it uh, because of the war in uh, Ukraine. So uh, because everyone is afraid of the Russians in Sweden since a long time before. Uh, so it was wars with Russia, uh, it's not because of socialism only. It was wars with Russia during long period. Period. Yeah, was it the answer? Yeah, and then it was about opportunism in uh, in the Swedish Communist Party. So uh, our party, like, do you mean now or you mean historically? Both. So historically, uh, of course, uh, the Swedish Communist Party as a part of uh, the Communist International, one of the founding parts of the Communist International, uh, never had actually own uh, independent role, we would say, of studying our history. Uh, so it was always uh, changing uh, opinions uh, with uh, the different uh, eras of the Communist International. So we can say uh, during, during the first per period, it was very revolutionary. During, during the second period, it was uh, not. During the third it was, and, uh, and then it was not. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the same as the history of uh, the Communist International. Uh, and we, we, we cannot uh, find any uh, evidence of such an discussions, big discussions having been held in Sweden. And that is also a big topic, right? Because uh, we, of course, we can, we can trace the opportunism back and we can trace it even more back and we can trace it even more back. So what was the decisive, uh, when was the decisive uh, uh, 
moment when it appeared, you cannot find it because it's uh, it's more or less the same thing that uh, that uh, they discussed in the 50s. Is uh, essentially what uh, Lenin discussed in what is to be done against the economists. It's es essentially the same as uh, Marx was criticizing uh, in the Gotha program, uh, in uh, social democratic program of. Uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany. So you can you can see it all the way back. And also, of course, we need to understand that when they uh, when the Bolshevik Revolution, the October Revolution, took place, that was the only alternative that was presented to the Social Democratic parties against the reformism and the war. So all all parties that joined this had not by themselves come to that conclusion. They were not. Uh, uh, like we have had long discussions and we have taken the uh, experience from that and come to this conclusion. So a lot of, of, of the parties that were in, in the uh, Communist International, it was like the Swedish Communist Party was a lot of different, <laughs> different tendencies and uh, different uh, thinking inside. And they was in the Communist International and uh, it was a very heterogeneous group. Uh, and they, it, it was not mature, and the Swedish Communist Party was not mature. Capitalism ha hadn't existed for a, a long time in Sweden. Uh, so, and, and how we deal, dealt with that problem uh, for ourselves now, it was actually because of the Swedish Communist Party being so small, and so like it was not even, it was almost not existing for like 10 years ago. So there was no opposition. So they were only happy to see young people coming into the party. Uh, and uh, okay, you say this, it's all right, because we, we need to understand that uh, grow, growing up uh, inside um, a communist movement in the 50s and 60s means that you have a lot of conceptions of what it is to be a communist, right? And uh, that is Marxist-Leninism. It's what the Communist Party of France said in the 50s. It's the Communist Party of Italy in the 60s and 70s. That is uh, Marxist-Leninism. But me, my generation, and younger than me, we have not lived during so uh, Soviet Union. We don't have any... Um, um, we don't have any nostalgia or we don't have any uh, friends that we grew up with and uh, had these thoughts together. And I don't have a lot of friends that I sit and talk to like about these things and how it was in DDR or something. So we can, we can see this with no feelings, right? We can, we can analyze DDR and the People's Republics of uh, Hungary and all these things. We can see that from an outside perspective. And I think that's hopeful. For uh, for the future, kind of yeah. So so it was not uh, we didn't have to deal with it in that way. Uh, all right. So just first to make sure I understood what you had said earlier. Um, I think. To summarize, you said it was necessary for the Communist Party to maintain basically like a hard line and not be drawn into coalitions with uh, sort of opportunist anti-NATO groups. Um, just curious, like what does that mean concretely? Does it mean, you know, writing very clear theory? Does it mean, I don't know, forming independent alternative uh, organizations or, or services that might draw in someone who is suddenly concerned about joining NATO? Uh, like concretely, what does that mean? For Sweden, and what would you think this sort of uh, hardline strategy would mean uh, in general for communist movements? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, what your general approach is to uh, mass organization. If you are working currently in the unions, how, how it works, if it's still like, if uh, communists allowed now, if they are discriminated against, um, yeah. And like, I think it might be like a tough sell currently um, to uh, be against NATO. Like, how is the general public thinking about it? Like, uh, how do we approach this uh, position without branded, uh, to be branded like a Russian asset or something? 
like how do you uh, deal with the fear? Yeah, and, uh, and I would like to know, um, there's, there, there are some similarities to Finland, and uh, do you, are you in exchange with uh, Finnish communists about this topic, and do you think uh, it could be possible to, um, to organize something uh, together with, uh, with Finnish comrades, or is, is, it, is it too different? Yeah. Uh, so of course this is a very dif this is the diff difficult questions. Um, so you can in theory it's everything is easy, right? And in in practice it's uh, it's much more difficult, of course. So about the the uh, coalition and uh, hard line and so I wouldn't consider it a hard line. Maybe you can say that, but uh, uh, so. <laughs> when you say it's hard line, it's like it, it sounds like kind of you know the criticism against Lenin of being dogmatic and all these things. So, but but we act actually for real believe it's not for for me being like the best theoretician or something like that. It's it's like we actually believe that people needs to understand. They, they need to understand what NATO is. They need to understand why Sweden wants to join NATO because if they understand that, they can also understand a lot of other things about how capitalism works and also be anti-capitalist. That's, that's the main thing. That's the main issue. So for Sweden, actually, it doesn't change so much and we cannot change inside. Like, to have a belief that we can change Sweden with reforms inside of the capitalist system to go back to a step where it was before, that's haven't happened like we know everything about this like we can study history right that's not how these things happen so the things happens to be very clear like when you put the gun on the head of the of the capitalist then they give you reforms right it's not because if you ask for reforms they give you reforms so uh, that has never happened in in the history of capitalism and there is no reason in theory either that it would happen so these people that are joining nato we need to talk to them and that's what we're doing. We're arranging demonstrations against NATO, but uh, and everyone is welcome, but not as a party, right? So we we don't have different. We we don't want to collaborate up uh, in parties. So there's no no need for us to be to 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 cooperate with uh, some party that says that uh, yes, uh, Russia is good and this is good. Like you 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 cannot find clarity in this. We need to cooperate with the working class needs to co uh, cooperate, we need to be build anti-capitalist sentiment in the, in the working class and also in other uh, parts of the society, right? So we have different parts of society that needs to feel solidarity with the working class and to, towards one another. Of course, in a, in a country like Sweden where, where it's the, uh, capitalism is so developed, we don't have uh, so much other uh, kinds of, uh, you know, middle classes or something like that. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have workers, we have small farmers, but they practically don't exist anymore. It's very, very few. Uh, so that's how we need uh, unity. We need unity amongst people, not amongst parties. And then we have a question about mass organization, if we're uh, participating in ma mass organization, or was it uh, just about uh, labor movement, union movement? Yes, we have had this question, and it's not solved. So we have, we have, we have had the line that we we are working inside the uh, the trade unions, uh, and uh, we try to to receive uh, posts inside. Like for me, for example, I'm a, a elected union. How do you say leader in my apartment? So uh, I work there, and they know that I'm a communist, and uh, uh, when. Whenever I can, I, I pass, like, try to pass uh, uh, anti-NATO or whatever. Like, uh, they know my stance and, uh, and so on. And that's what we expect from our members to be people that uh, other people, like, like, wherever you are, it can be in the, in the, uh, do you understand when I say that? Higher, uh, it, it's because I understand so many German words, so maybe you understand some Swedish. Uh, so it's uh, when you rental, 
organization, rental people that rent their homes. So you're in rental organization. That's mass organizations in, inside the. Uh, but we we want what we actually want to do is to build our own organizations uh, like this. We haven't that strength, but we have tried, and uh, we have uh, this thinking that uh, this is necessary. So we need to build uh, the, upon. We have a stra strategy of uh, social alliances. Uh, that uh, we need to build up. Uh, so, so I don't know. Is is that? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. And then uh, you also asked me something about this before, and it's like, is it uh, the right way to work inside the unions, or is it uh, not the right way to work? Do we need to step aside from the unions and work somewhere else? And it's a difficult question. I think Italy was a very, very interesting example when they changed the instead of working inside the unions, they took the other unions that the capitalists have worked out inside the factories and took over them and used them. So there is, I think there's no principle in this. It's a, a question about uh, like what is, what is most functioning. Was it uh, another question? Uh, Finnish uh, about uh, Finland. So uh, it's very difficult. That's uh, what uh, we're, we're fighting opportunism. Uh, it's uh, with other Nordic parties inside the initiative. So we're in uh, the initiative of uh, communist and workers parties and uh, inside of that uh, initiative we think it's the best parties but it's also a lot of the worst parties. So we're open with this uh, and uh, we're, we're not ashamed of talk, uh, talking about this because uh, we think we need clarity and we need to bring up the differences to the surface. We don't need unity, false unity. So we need, uh, we need uh, clarity. And inside the Finnish uh, party, uh, so we was uh, the ones that uh, was... <laughs> um, so there is two Finnish Communist Party, the Collins and Communist Party, so it's uh, the Eskopea also. And uh, we're not co uh, cooperating with them because it's a social democratic party. And it's the other one party, which I don't remember the acronym for, uh, but uh, maybe you have watched Finnish Bolshevik, uh, in, yes, uh, so, uh, so we have a good uh, re relationship with some of them, and we are responsible to uh, bringing them in into the initiative, and right after they come into the initiative, they, uh, um, so there you have a division between old people and young people, mostly, so uh, that's the same in a lot of uh, of parties, and we think it is uh, our uh, small contribution that we can do in uh, the fight against opportunism is to try to bring up these uh, contradictions uh, to the surface and try to deal with them and try to, yeah, do, do uh, with uh, arguments, <laughs> try to convince uh, people and uh, make, if it's necessary with a split, like there is no, we're not trying to split someone, but if they come, so we, we always take the part of that split that we think is uh, the best. So, of course. Yeah. So, um, a few questions of me. <laughs> um, okay, um, you said um, the, um, you have 15 big families, uh, Sweden is not a puppet. Um, I agree with you um, in this point. But the thing I, um, every time, Searching is um, what about the investments of foreign um, capitalists of foreign um, nations uh, to Sweden? I think it's um, important to to know this um, to have the whole picture about um, independency or not, or what means independency um, in actioning. Um, maybe you know something more about that, but. It's, um, then also, I think I'm interested in this, um, the relationship to Russia, uh, to Russia from Sweden. Um, did it changed um, from the Soviet Union to to now, or um, have Sweden uh, were more close to uh, close to Russia before, or it's uh, what what happened in this time, or it it was the same. And the third question is um, maybe a difficult question, but um, what do you think about the, our discussion and um, how relevant it is for an also small organi uh, communist organization like us in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, I had a similar question. Maybe I can, I can edit and then you can uh, answer to both uh, at the same time. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, you know, we have a plan of building a communist party in Germany and now we are having all those discussions about imperialism and the war in Ukraine and so on. And so in your opinion, what's the importance of clarifying the issue of imperialism and war as a precondition of, uh, of building a communist party? And uh, yeah, um, how, um, to what lengths should we go to, um, um, to achieve uh, unity in, this, in those questions? first question was about the uh, foreign uh, capital export inside of Sweden. So yes, uh, it exists. And uh, we can see a small shift, a uh, historical shift that uh, before it was more, uh, a little bit more American capital, and now it's a little bit more German capital uh, inside of Sweden. And of course, it's also a little bit more Swedish capital inside of Germany. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know so much uh, what I can say about that. That's how capitalism works. Um, it, it's, it doesn't make Swedish, uh, independ uh, Sweden independent of Germany. But of course, it, if, it, if we think that uh, in, for example, is it Slovakia, Slovakia, where Volkswagen has like 60% of the export of, is it Slovakia that Volkswagen has factories in? Of course, they can, uh, uh, they have uh, something to say about uh, politics in Slovakia. Of course they do. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not a difficult question. I think, and it doesn't change the, the, the understanding of imperialism uh, either. And the second question was about Swedish Swedish relationship to Russia. So, of course, uh, as we know, uh, the during the period of, like we're saying, uh, socialism in one country, um, the tactic to save actually. Soviet Union or to strengthen the position of Soviet Union in the world. So the communist parties adapted the position that uh, were like defending Soviet Union. So they were not exactly, but in a kind of way acting as ambassadors for Soviet Union inside, the, the, uh, inside, inside their countries. And a uh, position which a lot of uh, parties later left and became, became Euro-communist parties. Uh, so uh, uh, when Soviet Union was strong, uh, and had much to say. Uh, it was a very good thing for uh, for uh, the unions, of course, because as we said, uh, there were uh, al always a seat uh, left over for the, the ghost of the Soviet Union in the agreements uh, with the capitalists. So that's a fact, of course. So uh, no one uh, could, uh, li like the fear of the Soviet Union and the fear of the, uh, the people in power are very strong, very strong. And that's, that's how you make reforms. So uh, the, uh, you, you mean maybe the official standpoint of the government towards uh, so it, uh, Yeah, I, I guess it, 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 uh, it has gotten worse. So, but they, they, they use Russia as an, a tool today for uh, implementing NATO, uh, NATO membership and uh, to strengthen the military and take funds from uh, sectors of the economy to uh, the military and police force and, and these things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same, but when Soviet Union was as, at, at, at its uh, strongest, uh, the relationship were better. Um, maybe the inter-economics, the co economic relations? Uh, so, uh, Sweden is, is a country that is not dependent on foreign uh, power in, in that way, uh, like electricity. Uh, so Germany is very independent from gas from uh, from from Russia, but Sweden is not. So we have the lowest uh, prices on uh, uh, L um, uh, on power. Like in Europe, it's the lowest prices on power. Even if it has increased, it's uh, still very low compared to the rest of Europe. And it also, of course, makes Sweden more independent uh, in a way like of uh, foreign policy uh, towards Russia. So it can take a har harsher standpoint than, for example, Germany. So it's no doubt that Sweden is on the Ukrainian side. Of course, they have been uh, promised to build up uh, Ukraine and put uh, troops in, in the Baltic countries and all these things. So it's a universal. All parties are pro or against Russia and uh, pro-Ukraine. And the third question you had was about... 
what do you mean about the meaning of this discussion or how how many we have to know in maybe um, communist uh, organizations, more smaller communist organizations like us in Germany? And uh, yeah. And yeah so what's the question. yes? What's the importance of the of clarifying the issues of imperialism and war um, as a precondition for creating a communist party? And um, yeah, what maybe what to what lengths uh, communists should go to achieve those uh, to achieve unity in those questions? Um, yes. And maybe also in our situation. Because it, I think we are uh, agree also that we are <laughs> in a in a big communist party. We have to clarify this at all. But what is what what do we have to do now? All right. So I, I'm I, I don't want to address uh, your organization, but I can speak in uh, in general. Yeah. Uh, so I think that like. <laughs> like imperialism, the question of imperialism is like, of course, it is a, for us. It's 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 a precondition for having a communist party. Of course, like it's that's that's why the communist international was built from the beginning. So that is communism, actually. To <laughs> it's it's difficult to be a communist. I think like I, it's easy to be like the deformed communist party of the 50s and 60s that later became the left party. Uh, but of course, it's a precondition. So uh, and to 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 reach unity, like wh what I think in the end, like if you need to, if you have, I don't know how to put this, but if you have the knowledge or you have the possibility to get this knowledge, then in the end, you also need to have a character. Like you need to be able to say that imperialist war is bad thing, right? It's not a good thing that workers is being getting killed, right? You can. It's difficult for me to understand how you can have a, like a policy of the second international and support one country against another country in an imperialist war. I, I cannot understand that, and I cannot understand that from a human perspective either. Right, so uh, it's difficult for me to understand that thing. But I know it exists, and it's very good, of course, to have discussions again, uh, around it. But you cannot have this, those discussions for like years and years and years, right? So uh, we're not even in that uh, difficult position. Like in when you have a war, it's easier. Well, I, I have more understanding actually of uh, being in a war and like giving your support to the capitalists of one country because you're in a tougher position. Like now we're not in that position. Even we're not in that position. And uh, we take, some people take the stand of uh, imperialists. So now it's easier for us to have a theoretical view, viewpoint. And even now we don't take that stand. So, yes, I think it was. Uh, Genau, ähm, Diskussion, Fragen, was ihr möchtet. Wir haben noch zehn Minuten. Okay. Um, I would like to have your uh, opinion on, uh, you explained why the Swedish uh, capital class has an interest in joining NATO and is using uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine as uh, the just justification for that. Um, you also said that Sweden is... Uh, is uh, pretty much independent from uh, foreign capital. Of course, it, it exists, but it... Uh... Okay, in the energy sector. Uh, but my question is, what do you think uh, is Sweden's role in the future of the NATO? Ihr hattet gerade Wahlen gehabt, Reichstagswahlen. Ja? Ich verstehe das Wahlsystem in Schweden noch nicht. Kannst du ein paar Worte dazu sagen? Ähm, ich, das, das war sehr schwierig für die Partei anzutreten, 
Ja, und äh, kannst ja ein paar Formalitäten, wie das funktioniert dort in Schweden. Okay, I will translate it right away. Um, so he's asking about the elections that you had in Sweden. Um, there were parliamentary elections and um, he doesn't uh, yet understand fully the, the um, Swedish electoral system. So maybe you can uh, or maybe explain a little bit about that um, because uh, it seems that it was a little hard for the party to, um, to run for the elections. And how, yeah, why, why was that? Why it was so hard? Uh, all right. So the first question: What uh, what I see the future of uh, Sweden inside of NATO? Yeah, I see uh, Sweden taking um, uh, an even more active uh, role in in the uh, um, aggressions uh, in other countries. Uh, so even more military because they will get the the funds for the military races. So uh, they get uh, maybe two or three times more money to the military uh, spendings. Uh, than before, uh, which was already increasing, but now they can say this is the goal, like uh, the two two percent of the uh, GDP. Uh, so they will take a more active role. They have all already said that they are going to send permanent troops to bold countries, and uh, all other wars that are going to come. Maybe we'll see Swedes uh, go in uh, even more than before to these countries with bigger troops and. Uh, participate in the division of the world more aggressively. Uh, and uh, the other question was about the uh, elections in Sweden. So in Sweden, uh, it's four uh, percent you need to, to get to get inside the parliament threshold. threshold yes, and uh, also uh, if uh, um, it's also a threshold to come to get uh, funding from the state, funding money. So they give you money uh, to be in the elections. They give you the. Um, um, voting papers, uh, they uh, uh, they send they distribute them to the uh, all electoral. So uh, at every place, one thousand people uh, is voting, and this like very many of them, and uh, people uh, and and you need as a small party, we need to go there and put them, and we have half an hour before they opens. So it's impossible. Like we would need uh, 100,000 people or something to, to, to have our uh, papers in, the, in place. And we also need to pay for them ourselves. So we need to print them, uh, to pay for printing them in every election that we are in. And also this time we had problems. Uh, we couldn't uh, be in the election with our name uh, because they said it was similar to another name. It was the first time that happened. But uh, we also seen uh, due due to this um, uh, Ukrainian situation, we also see a bit more rep not repression, but we see also the ability restriction. restriction to restrict us and just say that we are like for Putin or something because we're communists, and uh, we see difficulties. We've seen bigger difficulties this time. So we didn't get the permission to be in the uh, in the elections until very late. And that made us be able to, so we, we, we was in with our acronym SKP instead of Swedish Communist Party. Uh, and that got allowed, but they pushed that forward, the decision, they pushed it forward. So we got the ability to um, uh, uh, buy the printing of the papers and be able to distribute it uh, late. So we couldn't, we hadn't the chance to, you know, we, what we usually do is give, put them inside leaflets and in forehand go to people and give them to people and in putting them in mailboxes <laughs> so they can have uh, the paper and go and vote in some beforehand. Uh, so we get it that very uh, late. And then of course, it's always a big, uh, uh, so the day of the elections, you put on the dress, the jogging dress, the jogging shoes, you have a driver next to you and uh, you break all the speed limits and they stop at one place, you run all you fast you can, you put the papers, uh, and then you run back, and then you go to next place, and you have to, one week before making Google Maps, you have to make the shortest distances and all these things. So it's a, it's, it's a real, um, it's good for your uh, stamina. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but of course it's designed for small parties not being able to participate fully in the democracy, of course. Uh, 
Okay, wir haben immer noch zehn Minuten. Möchtet ihr noch irgendwas sagen? Fünf? Ja, okay. Okay, I have to translate it, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I will try, yeah. Uh, what you said is that uh, what, that your um, input was very exciting and very interesting because especially what you said about the, the demonstrations against NATO um, and the, uh, this non-alignment movement in Sweden um, because, um, and this has become clearer to her um, uh, during the last uh, weeks or months because um, yeah, she, she, you know, she said she was on a membership assembly of the left party, this Die Linke in Germany. And at first they were giving speeches against the, the sanctions and the, yeah, the confrontation, <clears throat> the confrontational policies of, uh, of Germany against Russia and so on. Um, but then they were invited by an activist, um, to some kind of preparatory meeting, uh, for, in order to organize a peace demonstration. And on this meeting, there was uh, this idea that uh, if we reject the sanctions against Russia, uh, and the war policies, and if we reopen, uh, if we open Nord Stream 2, um, and so on, um, we will kind of go back to the old capitalism and um, the crisis will be over and everything will be fine. And yeah, this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, she says this is a, a mistaken view, of course. And in Germany, the, the German Communist Party also promotes similar ideas within the peace movement. Um, some sort of economic nationalism and um, so yeah we have to we have to promote and we have to strengthen the position of of Germany because this is harmful for Germany uh, so we should end the conflict with Russia and so on and um, they are for example demonstrating uh, together with people uh, that hold uh, Russian flags or German flags um, and no red flags at all on those demonstrations and she said it's a very dangerous position because it's uh, possible that in the future German capitalism uh, could turn away from the USA and the alignment with with, uh, with the USA and the transatlantic uh, partnership and so on. So this could even become useful for the German bourgeoisie to um, to approach uh, Russian or Chinese imperialism again. Um, so yeah, this I th I, I hope I I got the essence of what you said. And uh, so she she wanted to say that. We can transfer a lot of what you said about Sweden. We can transfer it to the situation here in Germany and uh, uh, draw a lot from that. And uh, yeah, for yeah, for our for a criticism of um, uh, some opportunist tendencies in the German movement. Last words from yes, you. I just want to, to make uh, one uh, final remark. Uh, so uh, about uh, what, what you said, like, uh, of course, we know that uh, imperialist uh, alliances are temporary. Even if they are for 100 years, they are temporary in the, in the grand scheme of uh, things, right? We don't know uh, which turns exactly the capital will take and what needs that they will have. So it is, uh, you have a, a, po a point there. We, we knew, know, like Brexit, for example, they left an, uh, an, an one imperialist alliance uh, to benefit, of course, uh, the export-oriented uh, capital of, uh, of uh, Great Britain. That was not; uh, they could not compete with Germany in the same uh, rule uh, with the same rules, right? So uh, that's uh, that's uh, yeah, that's a good point. And also, we need to to uh, to know that we are we are accountable for what what we say, right? And we're accountable towards the people. And if we say something to the people, we say that we tell them lies together, together with uh, anti-vaxxing organizations and whatever you have out there because they are saying they are against NATO. Uh, we are with them, right? So we're accountable for what, what we're saying and for what, what we're doing, of course. And what, what do we need to get out of this anti-NATO demonstration? <coughs> we need people to understand what imperialism is, right? And be uh, fighting against it. Uh, and also, of course, uh, propose the, the other kind of uh, production system, which is uh, socialism. Uh, so, yes, uh, we need to think about that. And also, I want a final uh, remarks. You said something about um, uh, being a small party or a big party and these things. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you're a small party. It doesn't matter if you're a big party. If, you're, if you don't have, uh, like, uh, if you're not a communist party, you're nothing. Even if you have 100,000 members. It doesn't mean anything, right? So we cannot say a party is good or big or, or something. It's big, not in numbers, right? It's in organizational strength 
and what you can achieve. That's how we, how we measure how big, how good, how strong a communist party is. It's by organization, position, clear position, fighting for the working class interest and how they are able to do that. It can be one person that is more worth than 500 persons, right? Of course. Uh, and, and the way this person organizes with other five persons might be very good and very effective, right? And can achieve very big things. So we also see in countries uh, that uh, went through revolutions that they were very few in one moment and then there were many in next week. <laughs> no, next week, but you understand what I mean. So it doesn't matter. It's the same for, for, for all, all parties.